All right, let's open our Bibles and go to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. And Christ has just begun the great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Probably the most famous sermon ever preached in all human history. And yet it's, it's amazing, bewildering perhaps, how little of it men actually know. And he begins with what are called the Beatitudes, verses 3 down through verse 12. It's a list of statements with no commentary about how happy someone is under certain circumstances, even unpleasant circumstances, unpleasant conditions. Look at verse 3, for example. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Bless, verse 4, blessed are they that mourn. Look down at verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Someone in an undesirable predicament is said to be blessed or happy despite it. Um, now, the, the best that liberal Protestantism can do with this passage is to spiritualize the whole thing. Uh, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose hope. And that's about as deep as they can go with it, with these uh, admonition, these statements. And there's usually it's agreed upon to be eight sometimes nine, depending on who's listing them. There are eight offered. Christ is speaking to his audience, third person. Blessed are they, such and such. And then about verses uh, 10, 11, 12, he says, blessed are ye, second person address. And sometimes that's separated from the others. Most people agree that there are eight, but I think there's probably nine in the list. I think I had to memorize this list in Christian school when I was in fifth grade. I couldn't recite it again uh, today, but uh, that's the kind of education we had in those days, which uh, I'm very grateful for. You know, the first step to canonization, becoming a Catholic saint, is what they call beatification. That is, they declare someone's life to be special and worthy of further investigation. So before he was called Saint Pope John Paul II, he was called Blessed Pope John Paul II. That was his sort of his status while they're investigating miracles attributed to him. He's sort of like a saint in the on deck circle. You know, he's uh, waiting to become a saint. Um, look at verse 5 in this, in this uh, section. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This saying is borrowed from Psalm 37. Verse 11. Turn there, if you will. Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. But it's defined in verse 9, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And join that to Zephaniah, a little book of Zephaniah, chapter 2. I'll give you a moment to find that. Zephaniah, chapter 2. I got fat fingers. I'm having a hard time finding Zephaniah 2. Notice verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. The real nature of the Sermon on the Mount is the lead up to his second advent, his second coming, and his millennium following that. Uh, the meek are not those who keep a, a humble, submissive demeanor as they go through life, but those who are uh, seeking to be saved out of their distresses, saved out of, their, uh, out of the great tribulation when they find themselves in it one day. 
in their dilemma. The meek have never inherited the earth up till now, and uh, they never will until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 in our text. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Righteousness is the, the sum total of the virtue, purity, and quality of your actions. And the, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, all our righteousnesses, however, are as filthy rags alongside the righteousness of God and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 21 Verse 21 says, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness, and honor. Devotionally, you could say that an unsaved man should thirst after the righteousness of God, embodied in the person of Jesus Christ himself. He said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, later in Matthew 6, verse 33. Look forward uh, also at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John 4 and verses 13 and 14. John 4 verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So that's what the sinner needs. That's the kind of righteousness he needs to seek after, is the righteousness embodied in the person of Christ himself. Uh, a saved man should be able to anticipate future rewards for doing right in this present life. Uh, to the audience at the time Christ was addressing, it meant those whose hearts were right with God would understand his first coming and the rejection by the religious leaders of Jesus Christ leading up to his death and um, then be filled with God's righteousness one day after Christ's resurrection, which actually occurred. Look forward at Acts chapter 4. Before any Pauline epistles were ever written, Acts chapter 4, notice there, oh, look back there at verse... Um, Verse 25, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage, and the people imagine vain things? That's from Psalm 2. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Verse, 30, uh, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Those who saw the rejection of Christ by the religious leaders and turned to him anyway, especially following his resurrection, were indeed filled with the... I don't know what would be more righteous from God except the Holy Spirit himself coming into the body of a, of a true believer. But that's nevertheless what they enjoyed. Now... Verse 7, back to Matthew chapter 5. To thirst after righteousness, that is, the desire for goodness, the desire for honesty, the desire for a, a, a life and a world where you don't have to trust, rather, you don't have to um, worry uh, and suspect the next guy, where you can trust your neighbor to be completely truthful and honest and to be looking after your welfare just as you would look after his. Um, and someone, they call it altruism, doing good 
just because it needs to be done without any desire, without any hope of, of um, reward. Doing something good just because it ought to be done, not for any expectation of any kind of a reward or recognition. Do it because it needs to be done. And that's the kind of life we wish we could live from cradle to grave. <laughs> No one's ever enjoyed a life like that from cradle to grave, but it's in the back of the mind of everyone. Everyone wishes and wants to live uh, in a world like that, but those that hunger and thirst after righteousness in the most uh, blessed sense of the term, the sinner needs to thirst after those after Jesus Christ himself, the embodiment of righteousness, and the sinner who has already met Jesus Christ needs to live a life uh, of right living and righteous living for the honor of Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you're not saved by your good deeds, but you're saved for the purpose of good deeds and good living in the honor of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, this general truth is apparent, and that's found in any age, any dispensation. And it's clear enough in other texts of the Word of God. Look forward at Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, Romans 12, and I'll start there at verse 18, Romans 12, 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Someone has defined grace and mercy as grace, God giving you something you don't deserve, and mercy is what keeps him from giving you what you do deserve. And both of those definitions uh, can be coupled together and almost interchange with each other. Look forward at the book of James. James and chapter 2. James 2. James 2, verses 12 and 13. James 2, verses 12 and 13. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. You know, the, the words liberty and freedom have been confused with each other. Liberty does not mean the freedom to do whatever you want to do without any consequence or any responsibility. Liberty means the freedom to do what is right. And then no one has to look over your shoulder and double check what you've been up to. It means the freedom to do what's right on your own. That is liberty. It does not mean license or freedom to do whatever you want to do. That's how it's been perverted and corrupted in modern America, that liberty means I get to do whatever I want to do. And no one can arrest me, no one can tell me off, or no one can say it's wrong. That's not what liberty means. Liberty means the freedom to behave yourself on your own, and then the police, the government doesn't have to come making you behave. You know, the, the, the worse a citizen behaves, the more powerful the government has to become to keep you in line. I wish it weren't that way, but human nature being as it is, that's the that's way, it's the law of the jungle, really. We're all living in it. But um, verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now, 
to expect mercy at the final judgment because you showed mercy to somebody once in your life is to stretch it. <laughs> That's not the basis of salvation or your gaining entrance into heaven. If that were the case, then you'd have to allow agnostics and atheists and unbelievers of every kind because every one of them has been kind to somebody in the, along the way. So you couldn't let anybody in. And that's, that's not the, the basis on which, by which someone enters into eternity with God. Um, verse 8. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Before, well, before I get to that, the idea of, of showing mercy uh, sometimes falls under the heading of the golden rule. Look, in fact, look at Matthew 7, verse 12. Matthew 7, verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. That's sometimes summarized as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And um, the idea of the golden rule is found in just about every philosophy and every religion throughout the world. Some are, in fact, most are stated as a negative. What you do not want done to you, don't do to someone else. Or what you would dislike being done to you, do not do to someone else. And it's almost a reactionary or a passive don't mess with them, and they won't mess with you. Mind your own business. Of course, people don't live that way. They always got to mind somebody else's business. <laughs> but, um, but they're all phrased in a negative way. Don't do something bad to them, and then nothing bad will come to you. That might not be true either. Something bad may still come to you. But, but the Christian way of phrasing it is active. Do unto others, as you would have others do unto you. You don't react based upon how they treated you, but you act positively first and trust God to make them act positively to you. He may have it, he may do it, he may not do it, they might appreciate it, they might not appreciate it, but you do unto others as you would have others do unto you. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, verse 8. He had no guarantee that we would respond and we would return that love in kind. He had no guarantee of that, but he loved us first. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. All right, verse 8. Let me read that again. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Once again, the Lord is repeating an Old Testament doctrine, well known to Old Testament saints, even if it's obscured to modern Bible commentators or modern, modern Bible uh, teachers. Go, if you will, to Psalm 24. Back to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, the context of this psalm is the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ as king one day, following the tribulation, the second advent of Jesus Christ, as it's often called. Verses 9 and 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. Every time you see that word in the Psalms, Selah, it's connected within just a couple of verses of some reference to the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Even though it's not spelled out, the connection is unmistakable as you go through the Psalms. But um, note verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Good questions. Who shall be worthy to approach 
to the king of glory when he comes, when he sits upon his throne to begin governing the nations. Um, it says the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Revelation 19 verse 14 says the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I expect to be a part of that army one day, and so will you as uh, glorified saints. But it's a good question in verse 3, a couple of questions. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? And the answer, verse 4, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Clean hands, no marks. And a pure heart. That's going to be works and faith coupled together. Look back, Psalm 21. Psalm 21. Psalm 21, verses 8 and 9. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Which one? Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the number of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 19, verses 17 and 18, along through there. Doctrinally, the expression pure in heart is going to have to deal with those who make it into a literal visible, physical, messianic, earthly kingdom coming out of the Great Tribulation. Devotionally, you, you, if you want to apply it to the saints now, go, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter two and I'm sorry, make it first Peter one. <laughs> first Peter one and verse twenty two, Peter says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Well, how does that happen? Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, by the, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. There can be no purity of heart now without the new birth of salvation. Once a person is born again, his heart has now been made clean because he's obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's trusted the blood of Christ by faith to wash away his sin and to wash away any guilt or stain of sin. But in the tribulation, those that are pure in heart will be those who obey the plan of salvation. And let me show you what that is. Go, if you will. Actually, two things, two main elements. Go to the book of Revelation Revelation chapter 12, Revelation 12, <clears throat> verse 17. And the dragon, that would be Satan, was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, works, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, faith. Look at chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, works, and the faith of Jesus. Faith. Faith and works will be coupled together as the means of salvation. Right now you are saved by grace through faith alone, without requiring any good works first. And also the second element of salvation 
in the tribulation will be found in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. No, he's not saying that. Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That is defined as the everlasting gospel, and the name of Jesus Christ is not found anywhere in the description. There's more than one gospel preached in the word of God. This is why we we believe so strongly in the need to rightly divide the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Paul tells the Christian what he's supposed to do, study. He tells him why he's supposed to study, to not be ashamed and to be approved before God. And then he tells him how he's supposed to study, by rightly dividing the word of truth. Some of the Bible applied to the Jew in the Old Testament. Some of it applied to the Gentiles. Some of it will apply to the Jew in the tribulation. Some of it will apply to the Jew and, and Gentile in the tribulation. Some of it will apply to those who make it through the tribulation uh, into the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ here on the earth. There is more than one gospel preached in the word of God. And anyone who can't grasp a hold of that, it seems to be self-evident you compare Scripture with Scripture, but for some reason it is ignored, it's sidestepped, it's uh, missed and reinterpreted by countless ministers and churches around the world. Those of us who believe that the Bible needs to be rightly divided and things put in their proper place so you can make sense of it all, are actually a very small minority of professing Christians. Most people think that all the Bible is just there for inspirational good feelings, mm -hmm. and then there's nothing more to be learned from it. If the Bible is simply symbolism, if it's just, you know, metaphor and figurative language, and you don't have to take everything exactly literally, you just enjoy the basic message of it, then Anybody's interpretation is just as good as anyone else's interpretation because you're not really narrowing it down and, and insisting on a certain uh, verbiage and a certain vocabulary, certain meaning of the words. If it's just loose and kind of floats in the air, anybody's interpretation is just as valid as anyone else's interpretation. Who's to say you're right and the other person's wrong or vice versa? You say tomato, I say tomato. You say potato, I say potato. Right? Let's call the whole thing off. That's the atheist approach. Right? Let's call the whole thing off. So we believe in rightly dividing the word of truth and that every word in our Bible is there by the providence and the will of God. It's there. and It's in the form he wants us to see it. Those are the words he wants us to read. That's the vocabulary he wants us to be familiar with. That's the language he wants us to uh, believe in and compare Scripture with Scripture so that the verses can comment on themselves. You start changing the vocabulary of one verse, then you've lost that verse as, a, as part of the overall picture when you're putting together a doctrine. So leave it all alone. I don't believe it's my job to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me. But those who just come to the Bible, Sermon on the Mount, people that think the Sermon on the Mount is the plan of salvation today, they're very selective in the verses they like from the Sermon on the Mount. Do you realize that eventually we'll get to the place where Jesus Christ is the first person to coin the phrase hellfire in the Sermon on the Mount? Nobody likes that one. That's part of the... Uh, the uh, That'll probably be eliminated all the new, updated, modern versions, if it's not already. Um, Hades fire, you know. <laughs> you want to soften the blow, tone it down. And I'll leave with this 
a little uh, humor. My brother and sister-in-law and I were talking early this morning. I work for a funeral home during the week. And, you know, we pass out these little programs or a, uh, a fuller obituary of the deceased. And I appreciate Sister Angie here because she'll, she'll uh, say amen to this. Us white folks in our programs, they say, we say, born and then passed away as the date of death. Black brethren, it's sunrise, sunset. That's how it's, it's all in all, all the funeral programs. I got to thinking, what about a few other alternatives? <laughs> On, off. <laughs> Stop, start. Breathing on their own, yearning to breathe free. Vertical, horizontal. Yeah, green light, red light. Bada boom, bada bing. If you're from Brooklyn. <laughs>